Mr. President, thank you very much. I rise this morning to spend a couple of moments talking about the uh, work we have to do between now and the end of the year. There are various ways to describe this, but uh, it's usually described under the broad umbrella terminology uh, called the fiscal cliff. Some debate uh, the use of those words, but there's no question that we have very difficult decisions to make in the next couple of weeks. My primary concern, and I think this is a, a concern that's widely shared here in the Senate and across the country, is what will all this mean for middle-income families? Where, what will their tax rates be? What will their near-term economic security be? And what can they expect for, uh, for their families and for, for the communities within, within which they live? And especially at this time of the year, because a lot of families are not just preparing for the new year and what will happen, they're also trying to make decisions about spending, about uh, holiday shopping, about investments, about uh, priorities that they have to invest in in their own lives. And we know from some of the data when it comes to uh, debating what will happen to middle-income families and their tax rates, we know the, the positive side of extending those tax rates for middle-income families. We also know the downside of not getting uh, that work done, not extending them. Just to give you two examples, the Congressional Budget Office says that extending uh, tax rates for the middle class would boost gross domestic product by 1.3 percent and would increase jobs by 1.6 million jobs. So two very positive impacts uh, if we can get the agreement, which I think we can arrive at, working with Democrats and Republicans to do this, to extend the tax rates for middle-income families. So G GDP up by 1.3 if we get the work done to extend those middle-class tax cuts and an increase in jobs of 1.6 million. Another way to look at this is from the, the negative side of, of it as well, the consequences of not getting uh, this work done to extend middle-income uh, tax rates. Uh, Mark Zandi, an economist who's widely quoted across the country and by many of my colleagues in the Senate, Mark Zandi says, and I'm not quoting here, but this is a summary, says that the economic impact of ending these tax cuts, uh, not getting agreement, uh, would reduce gross domestic product by $174 billion. We don't want to do that. That would be a very bad result for everyone. So whether you talk to, whether you read, I should say, the, the CBO numbers, or whether you talk to economists or read about their, their uh, assessments, whether you talk to CEOs, all agree that we have to deal with both the tax rate question for middle-income families as well as making sure we're avoiding the across-the-board cuts that I'll get to in a moment. So th there's much to do to solve what our uh, year-end challenge is, and we certainly have more challenges in 2013. But it's basically about uh, getting our fiscal house in order. Part of that is spending cuts. Part of that is, is getting more revenue. And as well as, even as we're getting our fiscal house in order, dealing with uh, various tax challenges along the way. Now, we should point out that there's been a lot of progress made. Just give you two, two examples of that. We know that when the national job numbers were announced in October, that part of the, re the reporting that was done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics was that we had an October number, but then we had a September and an August number that were revised upward, thank goodness. And when you combine the August, September, and October job growth numbers, uh, it means that in those three months we created more than 500,000 jobs across the country. Or I should say the economy created 500,000 jobs. The exact number is about 511,000 jobs. So that's a measure of progress. I was just looking at some housing numbers, or some housing assessments. We're releasing a report uh, or a summary of, of some data this week in the Joint Economic Committee. Um, just give you two examples on housing progress. The number of privately owned housing units that were started last month increased by 31,000 units uh, to 894,000 units at an annual rate. What that means is it's up about 3.6%. Uh, That's good news. Maybe even better news because we want to get the assessment of people in the trenches. Uh, and one, one bit of good news on housing is that confidence among home builders rose again 
in November. That, that'll also be part of that uh, report. So uh, an increase in jobs the last couple of months, more economic growth, more progress, more momentum, and good, good information or good news on, on housing. The problem is it's not good enough. We're not creating jobs fast enough. The pace of the recovery needs to accelerate. It's not moving fast enough for us to fully recover. I like to say, as many have used this analogy, we, we've been in a, a ditch. We've been down a, a pretty, uh, pretty uh, deep hole. We've been climbing out the last couple of years, but we're not out yet fully. We'll be out uh, and have a full recovery when we see those, see those job numbers increase. So these decisions we make on tax policy, on the end of the year agreements we have to reach are vitally important to continue that progress and in fact to move or accelerate uh, the job growth numbers uh, even faster. As I mentioned before, part of this isn't just about tax rates, it's also about reducing spending. Uh, fortunately, there's a, a track record, despite all the rancor and partisanship here in Washington, there's, there's all, also another a story of a bipartisan progress that was made over the last couple of years by agreeing to spending cuts. We agreed to a little less than a trillion dollars of spending cuts over the next 10 years. So it shows that we can, we can come together. The main point that I started with was on, the, on middle income families. We need to give middle class Americans certainty by the end of the year. Frankly, we should do it even before the end of the year. We should do it in the next couple of, of days or weeks. We can do that by saying to our friends in the other body, the House of Representatives, to say to them, pass the bill that we passed in the Senate, which gives tax certainty, a continuation of tax rates to 98% of, uh, of taxpayers. We should do that because it'll provide some certainty for the end of the year and for going into, into next year. I have an additional point to make about that as it relates to the payroll tax cut. Uh, we came together last year, at, at late 2011 into 2012, as we had done a year earlier, uh, to, to cut the payroll tax, to, to, to reduce that tax so that, that uh, most workers, most families in this country have about $1,000 extra to put in their pockets, more take-home pay that they can spend on their priorities and invest in, in uh, the priorities of their own family. Whether it's making a purchase for that family, may, whether it's paying for education, whether it's just getting from point A to point B, putting gas in the, in the car, whatever it is that that family decides to use those extra dollars for, it has had an enormously positive impact. 122 million um, Americans, or I should say households, uh, were positively impacted by that uh, payroll tax cut. What it means in terms of jobs, uh, about 400,000 jobs created. So one of the reasons we can say that we're making progress and developing some momentum behind the job creation numbers is because of the payroll tax cut that was put in place in 2012. We know that the kind of progress we're making, the kind of certainty that we want for middle income families can be badly undermined if we don't get an agreement not only on tax rates, but also on this across the board indiscriminate cut that would take place if we don't have a bipartisan agreement. It's known by that fancy term sequester or the, the other term sequestration. What, what that really means, and I'm not sure many people heard that terminology before about a year or two ago, but what really what that means is across the board cutting. Now some people say, well that, that sometimes makes sense uh, in my family or in my business or uh, when I have to make, we have to make a decision, um, sometimes we have to cut spending across the board. Unfortunately, if we don't make cuts that, that uh, help our economy grow, we'll badly injure our ability to, to grow the economy in the near term and in the future. So we all agree that cuts have to be made. The question is, how do you do that? Do you, cut, do you make cuts that are smart and that help us grow, or do you make cuts that are that are uh, indiscriminate without any kind of a strategy behind them. Fortunately, I think there's agreement here that across the board cuts, whether they're defense cuts, which will impact jobs, uh, or whether they're non-defense cuts, which will also impact the economy, that that doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't make sense to say all cuts are equal, therefore medical research should be cut uh, in the same way that a, an inefficient program should be cut. That doesn't really make sense 
And I think most Americans understand that. So we've got to get an agreement to avoid those automatic cuts. And I think we can. I think Democrats and Republicans agree that that would be the wrong approach to allow that to happen. I think we can get agreement on that. What we need is a balance. Just like when, when any family has to make a decision about their own budget or about their own spending priorities, they need a balance. And that obviously the balance is two parts. One is revenue, one is spending. So we need to get that balance in place. We also need, in order to achieve that kind of balance, Democrats and Republicans willing to work together, compromising, not getting everything that, that you want, but getting enough of an agreement that can move the country forward. Despite all the problems here, I have a, a high degree of confidence we can get an agreement that folks will come together uh, and compromise. Part of that starts with getting, or I should say, putting in place a comp or an agreement which is already one element to the compromise. And that's not just voting on, but, but having the agreement that says, let's have certainty right now for middle-income families. Everyone here agrees, with, with very limited exception, that we should extend tax rates, keep the tax rates the same, for about 98% of the American people. There's a broad agreement on that. Now, some on the other side don't want to don't want to have a, 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 a conclusion to that because they, they want to have a debate about what happens to the wealthiest among us, the very top uh, income earners, roughly about 2% of income earners. But look, we, we have agreement on the other 98%. So what I would say is whatever it takes to give meaning or integrity to the vote we had here in the Senate, uh, to, to get an agreement here, but also to encourage the House to vote to say, let's give middle-income families the certainty they deserve. Let's just say that we're going to agree, Democrats and Republicans, that 98% of taxpayers across the country are going to have their tax rates continued. Then we can have a big debate after that about what happens to the wealthiest among us. I think it makes sense at a time of high deficits and, and, a, and a debt problem that, that uh, will confront us for years that we have some part of that revenue come from the wealthiest among us. People across the aisle might disagree with that. We can have a big debate about that. But let's put in place, in law, uh, the kind of certainty that middle-income families should have. And I think we can, we can uh, do that. So let's get in place an agreement for the 98%, and then we'll have a, a big debate about the other, uh, the wealthiest 2%. And let's get in place uh, tax rates that will allow us to do that. I think a little history is instructive here. We know that um, in the 1990s and the 2000s, we know that there's, uh, according to the data, no relationship between lower marginal rates for the wealthiest among us and faster accelerated economic growth. And I emphasize no relationship because I think some have made the case. Two examples, during the Clinton administration, uh, to address the growing budget deficit at the time, which wasn't as severe as today, but it was a pretty substantial deficit. The top marginal tax rate was raised. It went up on the wealthiest uh, individuals, and the economy grew at the fastest rate in a generation, and more than 22,000 jobs were added. So that's what happened during the, the, uh, the President Clinton's two terms in office. During the following eight years, the top marginal rate was lowered, not raised, but lowered for the wealthiest individuals, but the economy never regained the strength of the previous decade, the 1990s. Job growth slowed and wages stagnated, leaving middle-income families especially vulnerable when the Great Recession began uh, towards the end of 2007. So that's some of the history that, uh, that is part of the foundation or, or undergirds the debate we're going to have here on tax rates. We, this isn't a lot of theory or a lot of maybes. We have data and information and kind of a track record trying it two different ways. The way we tried this under President Clinton and the way we tried it under the next administration. So I think that's, I think that's instructive. And finally, I, I'd say that for all, of the, for all of the challenges we have, for all of the disagreements we have, I think most people uh, in the Senate, no matter who they are, Democrats, Republicans, indep independents, whether they were running for office this year or not, all heard the same message. 
they all heard from people maybe two basic messages. At least that's what I heard in Pennsylvania, all across the state for longer than 2012, but certainly most, most fervently with a sense of urgency this year. Here's, the, here's what I heard, a two-part message. Do something to, to create jobs, or do more to create jobs. Move the economy faster. No question I heard that over and over again. And soon thereafter, within seconds of saying that, um, families or, or uh, taxpayers that I ran into across the state would say to me, you have to work together with people in the other party to get this done. You know why they say that? That's not some unrealistic expectation that the American people have of us. It makes a lot of sense because in every family out there, whether it's in Pennsylvania or across the country, in every business, small business or larger businesses, in every one of those circumstances, in a family or in a business, uh, those individuals have had to sit down over the last couple of years especially, work out differences, set priorities, set goals, reduce spending sometimes, make investments that they know they needed to make to grow their business or to create more economic security for their family. They've had to do that. And all they're saying to, their, to us here is just uh, take a lesson from, from the life of a lot of families in America. Sit down, set priorities, work on, on uh, coming together and get agreements. I think we can do that despite all the differences here. I think both parties understand the urgency of these questions, whether it's the tax rates, whether it's across the board uh, spending cuts, which would be indiscriminate and harmful, whether it's what we do about uh, individual uh, programs and what we do in the near term to reduce deficit and debt. We've got to come together as families have to come together and make agreements with, with people they're sometimes disagreeing with uh, or not getting along with every day of the week and the same decisions that businesses have to make uh, almost every day of the week or at least every month on their spending, on their priorities, and on their investments. Mr. President, I think we can do that and I know we have to do it. And uh, with that, I will yield the floor.